Good evening, friends. Welcome. And on behalf of uh, Third Reformed Church, I want to welcome you to this evening's conversation and lecture by Le uh, Annalisa Cox. Um, my name is Pastor Ryan. I'm one of the pastors that serve here at Third Reformed Church. And we're just so glad that you could make it, whether in person or uh, those of you that logged on to Zoom. Welcome. It is good to be together uh, this evening. Um, Christianity has this frustrating thing about it in that every time it wants to talk about anything, it has to go back to the beginning. Anytime Christianity wants to assert what's going on in the world around it and how the church ought to respond, one of the church's most insistent claims is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness over the hovered over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God rooted over the waters. That's it. That's We have to go back to the beginning all the time. And some people don't like that because that means that sometimes we can have a slow conversation, a patient conversation, a conversation that invites us without knowing the destination of where we're going, but insisting that the journey is important, particularly about things where we might find division, where we might find some conflict, where we might find some resistance somewhere. And it's kind of out of that spirit here at Third Reformed Church, at least in our localized corner of uh, Holland, Michigan, that we established what we call a justice and equity team because we believed that these conversations about the things that sometimes felt the most um, important to us, but also the hardest things to begin to unpack together, we needed to spend some intentional time doing. And so it is out of that committee that uh, continues to call the church um, back to itself, back to the beginning, back to the journey of these conversations. And that's why we're here tonight um, on behalf of the Justice and Equity team. So friends, I'm glad that you took time out of your evening. We're glad as uh, um, um, people of our Justice and Equity team uh, that you all showed up tonight, again, whether on Zoom or in person, to have this conversation. And it is in that spirit that I want to welcome one of the uh, members of our Justice and Equity team, Laura Baer, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Laura. Thank you, Ryan. Good evening. Um, we are very pleased here at Third Reform Church to welcome Dr. Annalisa Cox. Dr. Cox is an award-winning historian of 19th century America. She resides in Michigan and is currently a non-resident fellow at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, where she works with its director, Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Her undergraduate degree is from Hope College, where she majored in history, and she went on to receive a master's in philosophy and social anthropology from Cambridge University and a PhD in American history from the University of Illinois. Her original research underpins, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Her original research underpins two exhibits at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. While her writing has been featured in a variety of publications, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. Annalisa's recent book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land, America's Forgotten Black Pioneers and the Struggle for Equality, was honored by the Smithsonian Magazine as one of the best history books of 2018. She recently completed a major project for the National Library of Congress Folk Life Center, collecting oral histories from multi-generational African-American farmers in the Midwest. She has been a historical consultant for the Amazon drama, The Underground Railroad, and the PBS series, Finding Your Roots. She is currently producing the Questioning Conversations video series for the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program while completing her next book. Dr. Cox has graciously agreed to take questions at the end of her presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Annalisa Cox. <laughs> 
thank you so much um, for having me here. And thank you so much to Laura Bear for a lot of her hard work to make it possible for me to be here tonight, despite major blizzards and storms. Um, I also want to thank Third Reformed Church and the Justice and Equity team for inviting me here today. So I'm going to keep this to about 40 minutes um, and have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, so the title of this talk is Faith, Freedom, and the Founders. But first, let's talk about history just for a minute. Okay, I want to applaud all of you for being here, virtually or otherwise, because for most people, we were taught history in high school, and it was incredibly boring and hard to deal with, right? A seemingly random jumble of dates, facts, people's names that we were forced to memorize, most of us pumping and dumping as soon as the exam was over, right? Just want to be honest here. I know that's tough. But here is the weird thing. This subject that so many of us were taught honestly so poorly has become a battleground at the moment. And I do not say this lightly. I get death threats just because I'm revealing new facts about the American past. But I want to explain something about my field, about history. It is not a subject. It's not a textbook. Sure, it's those things. It's not just a set of facts and dates that everyone agrees on that are laid out clearly. History is a craft, a trade, a set of skills like woodworking or coal mining. There are some things, there are some that say that all new discoveries that we make about the past should be suppressed because they are revisionist history. But the field of history is perforce revisionist constantly. It is not static. The craft that historians learn and undertake is to learn new facts about our past from resources that we may not have been aware of or ignored until now. But that new information that historians are trained to dig up to mine, if you will, offer fundamental new information about the past that is essential to understanding both our roots and where we are today. Criticizing an historian for finding new unknown facts about the past is like saying that physicists should be attacked and their works banned because they make a new discovery about black holes or supernovas. To be fair, Galileo was imprisoned for asserting some facts about our solar system that made some people feel very uncomfortable, right? I also know that there are certain words, certain issues that are very hot topics at the moment. Words like, you can cover your ears if you want, diversity, equity, racism, slavery, and more. People believe or argue that racial diversity and racial equality is a new liberal, capital L, project, which overuses the federal government at the expense of states' rights, and that racial equality and diversity are not founding values. Indeed, the Claremont Institute, a conservative think tank in California, recently released this statement, and I quote, we are a proud leader in the fight against diversity, equity, and inclusion, or what they term DEI, since the ideology from which it flows conflicts with America's founding principles. I want to repeat that. Since the ideology from which it flows conflicts with America's founding principles. But here is a problem. When policies and actions and fights, which affect us today, 
are being based on an imperfect understanding of history, possibly even a myth-filled notion of our founding and our founding values without the actual knowledge of the facts of that past, of the actual founding values and founding citizens of this nation, then things get complicated. We need to know the facts. We need to know the facts of the founding of this nation, our founding values, our founding citizens. Not just what was said, but what was being done and by whom. Dr. Jamal Green, a professor of law at Columbia University, points out that Justice Scalia, the previous, now deceased, Supreme Court justice, who coined the term constitutional conservatism, made it clear that Scalia defined his position by how he thought the ratifiers and the founding generation believed. When he made his decisions, as a Supreme Court justice. So this talk will do just that. Look at the ratifiers, the diverse people who voted for the Constitution and made up the founding generation of this nation to better understand what we mean by constitutional conservatism and our founding values. And because I'm in a church, I'm also going to be talking about the faith of those founders and what was happening in the churches at that time. Okay, I know I just finished talking about it's not all names and dates, but I am going to be really specific about some dates here. All of this is happening before the Civil War. All of this is happening within the first 50 years of our nation's history, right? The Revolutionary War was one in 1783. A lot of us know about 1776, but that was a bunch of people writing a document, right? It wasn't a war won. The war, the Revolutionary War, was won in 1783. Let's talk about words for a minute. I will rarely be using the term racism in this talk from here on out. It is a 20th century term created to describe the horrifying antisemitism that arose during the Holocaust. Instead, I use the term prejudice because it is the term used by the founders and the founding generation. They understood racial prejudice as an evil that undermined the project they were working to create the project of democracy, not a monarchy where one person or a few told everyone what to do, but a government by the people for the people. And words matter. Words were spreading ideas like roots through our young nation during its founding period. Words that were growing ideas of something new and strange. So I'm going to read you a short poem. It's not terribly good, I admit it, but it gives us a glimpse into the mindset of the founders. Here is the poem. From the first dawning of the human mind, children should be instructed to be kind, to treat no human being with disdain, nor give the meanest insect useless pain. Our blessed Lord descended to unbind those chains of darkness which enslave the mind. He draws the veil of prejudice aside to cure us of our selfishness and pride. The same eternal hopes to all are given, one common Savior and one common heaven. When these exalted views the ascendant gain, fraternal love, will form a silken chain whose band encircling all the human race will join the species in one large embrace. Now, these words may sound like words to a 19th century hymn, 
written during the rise of a new abolitionist movement in the 1850s or during the difficult days of the Civil War, but they were written in 1805. 1805. They came from a poem written by a white woman, Isabella Oliver, who lived in Pennsylvania, and she was writing for an audience hungry for themes of liberty and equality. People had fought a war, a war that had just ended based on words, based on ideas. The strangest being that all men are created equal with an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. James Otis was one of the best known and most influential American writers of this revolutionary period. He wrote formal letters of complaint to the British government that were printed and read throughout the colonies. In 1764, years before the Declaration of Independence was written, he wrote, and I quote, the colonists are by the law of nature freeborn, as indeed all men are, white or black. Does it follow that tis right to enslave a man because he is black? End quote. He added with deep irony that people of prejudice like to point to physical differences between Africans and Europeans as a reason for enslavement. But he argued, and I always imagine him speaking these words aloud in a pub with like his hand around a big pint of ale, right? He said, will short curled hair like wool instead of Christian hair, as tis called by those whose hearts are as hard as the nether millstone, help the argument? Right, 1764, he's arguing against racial prejudice and against slavery. Otis also referred to the brilliant and satirical arguments against prejudice and slavery that the French philosopher, the Baron de Montesquieu, whose work from 1748 was popular and well-known in revolutionary era America. Montesquieu was already familiar with the many arguments enslavers made to defend the enslavement of people from Africa. And knowing this, he wrote a devastating and very funny attack on every defense of slavery and prejudice they put forth. This book was a bestseller. It's a book of philosophy, right? But it was translated into English and it became a bestseller in colonial America around the time of the American Revolution. One of Montesquieu's arguments goes straight to the heart of a defense of slavery made by enslavers and their allies in the United States, even a century after he wrote. Those prejudiced enslavers in America in the 1800s were hauntingly like their counterparts in the 1700s, arguing that slavery was not an evil, but a kindness, because they, those enslaved were lacking in essential human traits that would enable them to care for themselves or live independently. Montesquieu addresses the argument at its face, stating that if slavery, and I quote, is pretended to be beneficial, end quote, because enslaved people are at least provided subsistence, then it follows, logically, that only those people, and I quote, incapable of earning their livelihood, end quote, should be enslaved. Montesquieu then asks, why would anyone want to employ such a diminished worker? He does admit that babies could possibly fall into the category of those benefiting from slavery because they require assistance to live. But as he points out, nature has supplied infants with mother's milk for their food, so they need not become enslaved to be cared for. And Montesquieu criticized not only slavery, but racial prejudice based on skin color and ancestry which he saw as dangerous to society because, and I quote, prejudices eradicate every tender disposition 
Now, in those days, they didn't have the term empathy, right? But this is what he's going after. That somebody who is prejudiced towards another person or group of people is hardening their heart. They're destroying their own empathy. He also led his readers to see both how ridiculous and how deadly prejudice was by presenting a story about the ancient Egyptians, which he probably made up, but that's okay, <laughs> being so prejudiced against people with red hair that they killed them. And the founders, the founding citizens, started acting on these ideas, these words. They started moving towards freedom and equality. They had just fought a war for these ideals, a war where black and white men fought side by side as patriot soldiers. And yes, they were black revolutionary war patriot soldiers. So freedom, even before the war was won, the revolution for freedom had begun. True, when finally signed in 1787, the Constitution included much meant to strengthen the power of enslavers to keep people in bondage, even if those people tried to run or rebel. And patriots with printing presses had done everything they could to foment hate and prejudice to rouse the fighting spirits of white men. But even before there was a Constitution, the fervor for freedom had started. Enslaved people knew of the words of the Declaration of Independence, those words about the self-evident truth, that all are created equal, that all those equally created people have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And their white lawyers knew those words, and white judges knew those words, and together they were acting on them during the founding period. Around 1781, an enslaved man called Falk Walker sued for his freedom in a Massachusetts court alongside a woman called Mumbet. Other enslaved people were petitioning for their freedom as well. And when these two won their freedom in 1783, they won freedom for an entire state. For the judge agreed that among other things, slavery was at direct odds with the words of the Massachusetts Constitution about the equality of men. And you're like, okay, slavery abolished in Massachusetts, no big deal, right? Let's remember, in 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was written, every single one of the colonies had legalized slavery in force and in numbers. A lot of the way we think about our nation is post-Civil War, right? North versus South. But there was no North versus South in 1776. It was all slave colonies. A group of enslaved people in New Hampshire argued to a judge in 1779, while the Revolutionary War still raged, and I quote, freedom is the inherent right of the human species. But it was, and they won their case. <laughs> but it was more than the courts. It was the idea of liberty. Enslaved people had been suing for and even winning their freedom for a while without affecting more than their own individual personal freedom. But that was before the Declaration of Independence. That was before the American Revolution. Some white Americans had been turning their, to, toward freedom because of their faith, right? We all know of the Quakers. But there were others during this period. The Episcopal Methodist Church, at its first conference in 1784, one year after the end, of the American Revolution, took a firm stand on slavery and the equality of all people, regardless of the color of their skin, stating in their church documents, slavery is contrary to the laws of God, man, and nature, and hurtful to society, contrary to the dictates of conscience and true religion and doing what we would not others should do unto us. And in 1794, 
the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church resolved that any person who keeps, buys, or sells a human being is, I quote, a man stealer, end quote, which is the highest kind of theft, unquote. And they said, this is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. As the ideas of freedom and equality were gaining power, whole states started tipping towards freedom. Vermont was first in 1777, before some even thought of it as a state, and then more started joining the cause. By 1804, seven more states had followed Vermont's lead, including Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. This meant that a total of eight of the nation's original 13 colonies had voluntarily decided to end slavery by 1804. These were not easy decisions, for they had an impact not only on those who owned enslaved people, but on those who were involved in the lucrative slave trade. And when the slave state of New York finally decided to gradually abolish slavery in 1799, the other slave states must have been stunned. New York Harbor is today filled with boats of tourists traveling past a statue dedicated to liberty. But once, those same waters carried massive ships filled with people in chains. And the sale of those who survived the brutal and often deadly journey was making some New Yorkers very wealthy. New York and Rhode Island were some of the busiest slave ports in America. In 1785, after fierce resistance, New York decided to end the sale of enslaved people imported into the state, effectively closing its ports to those massive ships. And in 1799, that state decided to slowly end slavery. This turning away from wealth towards liberty must have been a shock to the remaining slave states. True, it was a slow turning, and for years in an incomplete and far from perfect one, but it was still a turning. In other states where white people could not be convinced to officially give up enslavement, granting freedom was made easier. Colonial Virginia had long had laws intended to make manumission or the um, freeing of enslaved people very challenging. But this was a new time and a new nation. And even Virginia eased its restrictions on liberation. Between 1782 and 1806, roughly 10,000 people were recorded as freed in Virginia. And North Carolina's free African-American population rose from roughly 5,000 in 1790 to over 10,200 in 1810 despite its much stricter manumission laws. Other states like Maryland and Delaware made new laws not only encouraging freedom, but also discouraging the removal or sale of an enslaved person out of the state. This was an extraordinary time, full of confusion and conflict, but also hope. And moves were being made towards equality. Now, the Northwest Territory almost doubled the landmass of the new United States. We are standing, or sitting, in the Northwest Territory. It's a region that would become Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And that entire region was designated as slavery-free. But another clause in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance was significant, a clause for equality. For the ordinance gave all free men the right to vote. To be sure, those free men or anyone else who wanted to vote anywhere in the nation at the time had to be men, with the exception of New Jersey for about seven years. And yes, women had the right to vote during the revolutionary era. This was a strange time, folks. And they had to be property owners, 
the writers of the ordinance decided that a man must own 50 acres to vote and 200 acres to run for office. There were other caveats as well, but none of them, not one, mentioned skin color. This was not in just light, light omission. This was knowing inclusion. It was understood that if skin color was not mentioned, then any property holding man over the age of 21 could vote. Indeed, the wording of the 17 or 87 ordinance, which governed this region that we're in, was very similar to North Carolina's 1776 constitution, which also stated, among other lengthy requirements, that, and I quote, all freemen of the age of 21 years could vote but none of those requirements used the word white. And soon, free propertied African-American men were voting in North Carolina and in this area. And North Carolina was not alone. By 1792, 11 other states had similar constitutions, refusing to use color to confine the vote including the newly created state of Kentucky, which had entered the Union that year. Of course, in that same year, whites in Delaware, in a backlash against the growing number of free people of African descent in their state, worked hard to exclude all but whites from the right to vote. Still, in 1792, on the eve of the nation's second election, as it stood poised to reelect George Washington as president, the entire Northwest Territory, as well as 12 of the nation's 15 states, had decided to use inclusive language in their constitution to welcome all men, regardless of the color of their skin, to vote, 1792. And free men of African descent started voting from North Carolina to the Ohio Territory, from Massachusetts to Tennessee. And free men of African descent voted to ratify our nation's constitution. We must keep this in mind when we remember Justice Scalia's concept of constitutional conservatism as being based on the ideas and values and mindsets of those who voted to ratify the Constitution. We must be aware of what people of African descent were valuing, writing about, and arguing for at this time because they were part of the ratifiers. And I will return to this later. I want to take a quick digression into churches. There is concrete indication that there was a pattern of integration and equality in revolutionary era churches as well. Probably one of the best known preachers of the revolutionary period is Richard Allen later Bishop Richard Allen, the African Methodist Episcopal Church Bishop. He was born enslaved around 1760 in Philadelphia. Yes, he was enslaved in Philadelphia. And as a young man became a freedom entrepreneur, a term I have coined for someone who works extra hours while enslaved to raise a large sum of money in order to purchase themselves. And he did so in 1783 and he was soon preaching to whites and blacks in Baltimore. In 1786, he was invited to Philadelphia where he began preaching at the integrated St. George Methodist Episcopal Church. John Chavis was born in North Carolina, also in the early 1760s. He fought as a teenager, as a patriot in the Revolutionary War, and was educated at Washington Academy, later Washington and Lee, as well as the College of New Jersey's Theological School, which later became Princeton University. He was licensed as a preacher by the Presbyterian Church in Virginia on November 19th, 1800. And he started an integrated school in North Carolina in 1808 at a time when North Carolina 
would if it would have allowed him to vote since he was a propertied free man in that state. Founding era, founding values, founding citizens. Matthew Sweet writes of the African-Americans Samson Oakham, Lemuel Haynes, and Thomas Paul, who all preached to white and integrated congregations around New England in the 1700s and early 1800s. And this is an image of Lemuel Haynes up on the screen, preaching to a racially integrated church the size of Third Reformed or larger. Now, Lemuel Haynes argued forcefully from the pulpit that the revolution should not be considered over until slavery be abolished. James Easton was a Black Revolutionary War patriot of many ancestries, including African and Narragansett. He and his wife, Sarah, had been born and raised in the area of Bridgewater, Massachusetts. James Easton would go on to create a hugely successful ironworks in the area where he also ran one of the nation's first labor institutes. In 1780, he was a single young man still fighting in the Revolutionary War, and he decided to join the first, sorry, the fourth Church of Christ in Bridgewater. He married Sarah around the end of the war, also a multiracial woman who had deep roots in the area. Her father, Samson Dunbar, was a founding member of the Bridgewater Baptist Church, and her brother Joshua Dunbar still attended. Both Sarah's father, brother, were also patriot veterans of the Revolutionary War. But when Sarah Dunbar married James Easton, they started attending his church, Fourth Church of Christ in Bridgewater, alongside whites. So here's where I want to be clear. There's long been a pattern of advancement and backlash against the founding values of this nation. And as I mentioned in my recent book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land, around 50 years after the end of the American Revolution, white politicians were actually standing up in Washington, D.C. and saying, that we needed to forget the words of the Declaration of Independence, that we needed to forget that all men were born equal because these politicians said they were not. So there was actually backlash against our founding documents, right? Racial segregation takes energy and even violence to create. Diversity and integration, as this revolutionary era shows, should be the norm. But in case after case, we can see that white spaces took work and took force to create, and backlash happened in the church as well. As George Price reveals in his excellent book on the Easton family, in 1789, after they had been members of their church in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, for years, including paying for their pew and having their first three children baptized at that church, they were told by the white leaders of the church that the church was going to be segregated. From then on, all people of color, as the church leaders called them, had to sit in a balcony being built at the back of the church with its own separate entrance into the building. James East, a patriot, a man of faith, and his wife and children refused to be segregated. The Easton family came into church, sat in their regular pew, and were physically dragged from the church by the white congregants that they had worshipped alongside with for so long. In an astonishing excerpt from the Bridgewater Baptist Church records, on September 1, 1812, the white elders of the church report being dissatisfied with the conduct of James Easton, end quote, because he complained to them about being forced to sit at the back of the church. They were furious that James Easton had said that their prejudice was proof that they were straying from their path as Christians and were, this is what James Easton said, joining in an affinity with the world. 
and by implication, the world's prejudice and pride. They were also offended by the fact that James Easton accused pro-segregation and prejudiced members of the church of being hypocrites. Soon, the white elders had decided to suspend James and his family from the church altogether. Around a year after Richard Allen began preaching in Philadelphia, whites in the church insisted on a separate 5 a.m. service for African-American members of the church. And when Pastor Allen tried to take communion and pray during the regular service, he was forcibly removed. This violent act of segregation gave rise to his founding the African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1804, when Lemuel Haynes, the man on the screen, left New Hampshire for Boston, he was told, they do not mix colors there. This is Boston. And he finally had to form the African Baptist Church in Boston in 1805. This was something he didn't want to do. He wanted to continue to belong to an equal, diverse church that was a part of his founding beliefs and the founding beliefs of this nation. Indeed, in the light of the reversals occurring in the Northeast and New England in 1804, Oliver's poem, which I read at the beginning of this lecture, could be read less as an assertion of reality than as a poem of protest when she wrote, our blessed Lord descended to unbind those chains of darkness which enslave the mind. He draws the veil of prejudice aside to cure us of our selfishness and pride. And Isabella Oliver was far from alone. There continued to be African descended people and white people of deep faith and revolutionary values who refused to give up on the best ideals of the new nation, even as so many people turned their backs on those ideals. Dr. Derek Spires, in his important new book on early Black citizenship, reminds us of the important essay published by African Americans in Philadelphia in the 1790s. And yes, African Americans in the 1790s could read, write, and they were publishing. They reminded their white neighbors in Philadelphia that good citizenship must be defined by who is a good neighbor, making direct reference to the biblical story of the Good Samaritan. They reminded the white citizens of Philadelphia that they had stayed behind to nurse and care for all of their neighbors during the yellow fever pandemic that had hit that city and that they had died even as they were aiding others. These are some of the values and ideas of our founding citizens. The ideal of the Good Samaritan, the idea that anyone enslaved or free was a citizen if they acted as a good neighbor and thus should be included, should be integrated, should be diverse, should be equal. And I want to add, that the truth matters, right? These are facts. These are truths about our past. It's interesting to me, if we look at the both the Old Testament and the New Testament, how many times truth is held up as a gift and a blessing from God, right? Over and over again. One of my favorite quotes is by an African-American human rights activist. I know that sounds modern, but Human rights is a term created by African-American abolitionists before the Civil War. An African-American human rights activist of the pre-Civil War era, a man by the name of Henry Wagoner, who wrote some important words in 1856 before the Civil War broke out. And I'm going to ask Professor Johnson from Hope College if he would read these words. I think it's most important that he do it. Thank you, Professor Johnson. But we all agree that money is power and knowledge is power. Let us not forget that more powerful than both these combined is truth. Money and power in the vicissitudes of human life may both be lost or wrested from us, but truth, absolute truth is eternal. Like his great, great author, 
the infinitely wise and gracious God. Man may disregard it for a time until the period arrives when it's raised according to the determination of heaven, irresistibly break through the mist of prejudice and like the opening of day, shed a clear and unextinguishable light over the generation of men. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson. We are done. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Annalisa, for that presentation. Um, and we would like to take about 20 minutes now um, to take questions from the audience. Um, we've got a couple of mics, so if you have something you'd like to ask, please raise your hand. Hopefully I haven't scared you half to death. <laughs> there are a lot of questions I'm sure you have. So if you do have a question, just raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you, and um, then they can hear it on Zoom. Oh, we've got, and we've got a hand up over there too. Yeah. Thanks. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the backlash that occurs in the early 1800s, right? Uh, New Jersey rescinds the right to vote. Pennsylvania does the same thing mm -hmm. in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. What's motivating that <clears throat> besides the sort of waning of the revolutionary ethos and the waning of the revolutionary generations? What, what else is going on that leads to that backlash? It's a good question. There's a lot that goes on, right? I mean, during the revolutionary era, um, all Americans thought that slavery was going to die out because, you know, they had promised that the importation of enslaved people would end in 1808. And at that point, the system of enslavement was so brutal. Um, some historians have called uh, many plantations death camps. I mean, the rice plantations of South Carolina, the average life expectancy of an enslaved human being was three years, right? So um, basically, if you've got, if you if what you're producing is, is worth more than the people who are working to produce it, then you're just going to chew them up and work them to death. So that happened in 1808. Um, but slavery kept going, it kept growing. Uh, you have... Uh, um, you know, the nation is expanding and the founding generation is dying out. And I, 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 of course, there's always debate, right? Um, even during the American Revolutionary War and during that period, there were people who were pushing against it who didn't like this. It just was majority of people were of this mindset um, to the point where when William Henry Harrison, who was governor of the Indiana Territory, which at that time was the entire Northwest Territory except Ohio, petitioned um, the federal government three times in a row to expand slavery to this region uh, just for 10 years. He said just for 10 years. Um, this committee, which was overseen by a man from Virginia, refuted that, rejected it, right? So this is this is sort of across the board. This is not, not about North versus South. I just, I wish I could give you a clearer answer in some ways, it's like being asked sort of why does evil occur? Like, why does evil rise? Um, and I know that sometimes historians like to come up with really simple answers for these. Oh, it was economics. You know, it was, it was the money, stupid, right? Except that during the American Revolutionary era, when a lot of this stuff like equal voting rights and ending slavery was happening, we were in terrible shape economically, right? We're in debt to everyone. We're in debt to the Dutch. We're in debt to the French. Um, we're being, we have no Navy, we're, we're being pirated and, and um, on the high seas, like we're in a mess, yet we're still passing these, right? If somebody says, oh, well, you know, the majority of Americans have a tendency to tip towards racism when they get a little nervous about their economics, I want to say, well, let's look at the founding era, right? When everybody was nervous about their economic state with good reason, right? So I, I hesitate to answer that with a simple answer. I think it's probably very complex. What is interesting is that since our founding, we seem to have gone in about 50 year periods of advancement and backlash, right? Um, and it's something we need to be aware of as Americans. Um, and we need to be hyper aware of where we started 
and where we backlash to. I mean, by, you know, we've got the Missouri Compromise coming up 50 years after we won the American Revolution, right? So there's something going on where backlash is actually occurring. Um, people are being dragged out of churches. People are losing the right to vote, all of that. Um, it's a great question. I wish I could answer it better than that, but it's just something we should be aware of. Annalisa, could you could you draw a correlation between the anti-slavery provision in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and some of the other provisions for that territory that eventually found similar expression in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution? Mm, great question. Um, so the provisions in the 1787 ordinance, you know, some people have argued that the ordinance that governed this region, right? This region where we're sitting, that that became Michigan, that became Ohio, that became Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin, um, was being written and thought about <laughs> at the same time that our Const nation's constitution was being written and thought about. And in fact, that those people were talking to each other. There were just a lot more cooks in the kitchen where the constitution was being written, right? Um, and uh, so, <sighs> There, was, there were ways in which the 1787 Northwest Territorial Ordinance was more revolutionary than the Constitution could be. But I think it's really important to look at it. It's a four-page document. It's available on the National Archives website to get an idea of where the values, and we're talking, this was a document written by white men, right? Um, where the values of this nation were lying um, at, during this period, right after the American Revolution. Um, I, and I know that there's, some people have asked me about the, um, the two-thirds clause, like the, the, uh, about voting and representation, but that applied only to enslaved people in the Constitution. It did not apply to free people of color. And so I do think it's really important that we think about equal voting rights for free people of color um, when we're thinking about this period, because it is not some sort of 20th century civil rights project. It is, it is the sort of the heart, the beating heart of this nation as it was, as states were shifting from colonies to states, they're rewriting their constitutions to remove the word white with the understanding that that's going to open the right to vote. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me, but even Georgia, rewrote its constitution during the American Revolution to remove the word white. And I've had discussion with some other historians who've said, well, I don't know if that really made a difference because, you know, did did black people actually vote? Nobody's looked because everybody has assumed with a sort of post-Civil War mindset that no black person could have possibly voted in Georgia. But we haven't looked, right? I know that there were free people of African descent voting in South Carolina. Uh, who fought as patriots in the American Revolution in South Carolina, voted there. Um, and then in the 1790s, when uh, prejudice poll tax was put up against them, so it cost them money to vote. They were still voting, but it was costing them money to vote in South Carolina. They hired lawyers and, and sued the South Carolina state government in 1797. They lost and they moved to the Midwest. They moved to the Wabash River Valley in the 1790s to start again where they had under the ordinance the legal right to vote so they were they were refugees from prejudice right um but it's also absolutely proof that free people of color in south carolina were voting right and they're free yeah any other questions way in the back I'm just curious. Um, it's my understanding that Native people didn't get the right to vote until 1924. Mm. I was just wondering if you were able to find any different information than what I've known about, about that. So where Indigenous nations are concerned, it's a very complicated story, right? Um, and it's particularly complicated in places uh, in New England uh, where by the time the American Revolution breaks out, 
you have people who are triracial, like the Eastons, right? They're African, European, and Narragansett. Um, and they're voting. And they, they, some of those members of that family identifies Narragansett, and some of them identifies Black. Uh, so I think part of this is um, we need to be looking more closely at this era, because I think we... I think a lot of us, including historians, sort of think, well, of course, things just sort of get more and more liberal or better or whatever as we go through time. But what if history is more like, you know, a winding river? I don't know how many of you have driven to Kalamazoo from here, right? But you cross over the Kalamazoo River so many times, right? It's like an old winding river. Things move backwards, they get lost in swamps, they come up. Um, it's not just sort of an upward trajectory. And sometimes there's backlash, right? Indigenous history is not my forte. It's not my strength. Um, I wish I could speak to it better. What I can say is that um, there was very good reason for a lot of Indigenous people not to fight as patriots, but to ally themselves with the British, because the British had basically promised them this entire region, the Northwest Territory, as theirs, free of colonial settlement. And so they had absolutely no reason to fight a war, which was to win this place for colonial settlement, right? Um, but that's a whole different story. It's very, it's very interesting that the dilemmas you've just pointed out about Native Americans being born here, mm. but possibly not considered citizens for mm. the purpose of voting. And I'm thinking through when did Frederick Douglass decide that he was a citizen and was he a citizen? Mm. Uh, well, he would have had to have his free papers. He had his free papers by the time he came home from England in 1848, he had mm. his free papers at hand, and now he's moving to New York. By the time he gives the 4th of July speech, mm -hmm. he is saying fellow citizens mm -hmm. in the speech, not as a metaphor, but because I think I think he is claiming he is a citizen of mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. So it would be the states, correct? It would be a state that tells you whether you're a citizen or is that only federal? I mean, it seems like it should be federal, but the this state was... of New York was granting mm -hmm. him citizenship because he owned property and he had his free papers. So right. now he was free once he came to Rochester. Right. So that's a really great question about how do we define citizenship? And, and that's why I find Derek, Dr. Derek Spire's um, book on citizenship that just came out two years ago really, really useful. Because for a long time, historians have looked at it from sort of like, well, how did white people think about citizenship? And he's saying, well, how did African-Americans think about citizenship, right? And how did they define it? Um, and there were more citizenship rights during the American Revolution. Uh, coming out of states. Uh, interestingly enough, it's it, it, can I say both? Because of course the 1787 ordinance is a federal document that that guides the ruling for this entire massive region, which doubles the size of the then United States. And it says that anyone has right to vote without describing race and people of African descent are voting in this region in the 1780s and 1790s, right? Um, the instant Ohio becomes a state in 1803, they rewrite their constitution, they add white. They might as well have said, we're also a free a slave state, right? That is how big of a reversal that was. Um, and it's shocking to think that's coming out of Ohio, but it is. But thinking about the whole tension between federal and state and, and rights, right? One of the things that I find really intriguing is that there's, you know, often this notion about the Civil War and states' rights and all of this. But actually, the elite and slavers of the South wanted a really strong federal government. They did not like states' rights. Because if a state like Wisconsin or Michigan or Massachusetts or New York had a free tax-paying citizen who owned property and was working there, that this other state, say South Carolina or Georgia said, is actually enslaved property, you need a strong federal government to go in with its sticky fingers and take that citizen out of that state, thus invading states' rights, right? 
So a lot of how we think about the Civil War has been corrupted by narratives that happened after the Civil War. But if you talk to anybody before the Civil War, they would have been like, oh, we're the state's rights is what abolitionists wanted and and African Americans wanted and the elite enslavers wanted a strong federal government, just you know, as an example. But that's a long answer to a short question. Do we do we have another question? Yes. A couple more in the back. Any all right. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I would love to hear you talk about Thomas Jefferson. Mm, I understand mm. that he made some effort uh, to open a way for at least greater acceptance of slaves. And yet, of course, he owned many slaves, that is to say, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, as mm. I recall. But of course, my students are very curious about his relationship with Sally Hemings, mm, which, mm. of course, is complicated and, mm, mm. and intriguing. So mm. I'd love to hear what you have to say about him. Oh, I'll have to keep my statements short because there's, I mean, there have been books written on Thomas Jefferson, right? Um, and all of these complicated things around the Hemingses and, and slavery. Obviously, I've read a lot about him and um, he did change, right? When he first was writing that draft of the Declaration of Independence, he had an entire paragraph, which was fortunately anti-slavery and it was removed. Um, they're like, there's no way we're getting South Carolina if we include that, right? I, I sometimes, this may sound trite, but see if it makes a little sense. I, I sometimes think about Thomas Jefferson the way that like some people in the 1960s became hippies and they tuned out and they dropped out and they grew their hair long, they put it back in a ponytail and started writing about the equality of everyone. And then they hit their thirties and forties. Maybe they take over the family business their mind changes, they become a lot more conservative, right? People go through these changes. Thomas Jefferson was not one person, right? Um, but he was also not a man of his time. I have a real problem with that term. It's often used as an apologist for somebody who's acting in a way that, that maybe is prejudiced, <laughs> um, anti-justice, um, pro-prejudice, but so many of those men were actually making their time. They were not of their time, right? Jefferson had a close neighbor who um, freed 500 of his enslaved people. Jefferson knew this was happening. He could have done it. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated. And there, again, um, I'm not an expert on Jefferson. I do do delve into more detail into this in, in the bone and sinew of the land, but, um, he, yeah, by the time he was in his forties, he was doing some really horrific things, um, both to his enslaved people, the enslaved children, um, that, that, um, uh, that he was enslaving and just brutal and terrible. Um, and, and so these are, yeah, these are just difficult truths, right? Yeah. When the Northwest Ordinance was adopted, mm -hmm. what did the representatives of then slaveholding states say about it? How did they explain it to the people they represented who ver wanted very much to retain slavery? Right. Great question. Um, <laughs> actually, most of them were for it. Um, during the revolutionary era, the understanding was that the system of enslavery was an evil. And this was understood and stated in all of the states that it was terrible. It, it may be necessary, but it was terrible. And that it didn't work to have an actual democracy with a system enslaved, of enslavement in place. So everybody was in agreement that it should die out and not grow. During the founding era, that's why everybody agreed that the importation of enslaved people should end in 1808. And even earlier than that, in the 1790s, a group of abolitionists, many of them elite men from Virginia who had given up the enslaved people that they owned, formed an abolitionist society, which petitioned the federal government to end slavery. And they 
the federal government said, we can't get involved in states' rights, but we will end the export, the legal exportation of enslaved people, which was also devastating to the pocketbooks of Americans at a time when we needed every single tax penny we could get. In 1794, they said, okay, people can no longer be sold from our shores. So there, <laughs> the idea that, so Georgia and South Carolina and Virginia were different places in, 1750, in 1855 than they were in 1784. We have to remember this. They're not the same places. It's not the same people and it's not the same ideas and it's not the same rhetoric. Um, and in 1784, it was very, very different. I, I love a book called Deliver Us From Evil which uh, was written by a brilliant Southern historian. It took him 30 years to write. And it is the debate about slavery within the South by, by white Southerners talking to each other about it. And, it. and I think it gives you a really great idea of, it would give you a better answer than I'm giving you now. But yeah, um, again, the American revolutionary era and the founding era was so much more revolutionary. It was so much stranger then we give it credit, credence for, right? And, and in some ways it was so much more encouraging to us today. And, and you know, I wanna go back to something I said about Jefferson. Um, I think a lot of people at the moment are like, they're looking at historians like me and they're like, oh, you know, you're just trying to make us feel bad. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I just wanna add here that we may have to shift how we think about who our founders were and who our founding values were and who our founding citizens were. But unless we talk about the horrors, we lose the heroes, right? If we lose the horrors, we lose the heroes. And I mean, an example I could use is uh, probably some of you uh, have read, have watched the movie Schindler's List, right? About the Holocaust and a German man who tried to save Jewish people during the Holocaust. If we stop talking about the Holocaust, Schindler's story would make no sense, right? If we stop talking about the facts of the past, past, the truth of the past, not only do we erase the horrors of the past, we erase the heroes who arose to confront them, including in our revolutionary era. We lose Lemuel Haynes, right? Um, there have always been people in this nation who have stood up people of faith who have stood up for equality, for justice, and for hope. And I hope that we can all remember that. Yeah. And with that, I think I'm going to end, but I, I do, um, I do have business cards. I can give those out. People can email me or follow up with questions. And I've heard there's going to be cookies afterwards. I'm going to be there and I'm happy to chat with people too. So thank you yeah. for coming. Thank you.